I would just first like to thank uh, Norma and especially you, Liz, for asking me to come to BAM. Um, also, my friend uh, Gary Drossel, who you might know as your president as of today. Um, Gary and I met many years ago at the Society of American Mosaic Artists Conference in San Francisco. Um, I called him Mr. Fish Pond because I had known him from his um, wonderful pond mosaic. And um, we were both working artists that were swept up in this beautiful community of mosaic artists. And little did we both know that a few years later we would both be presidents of our organizations completely overwhelmed by the administration and sort of taken away from our practices a little bit. But Gary's um, more tolerant of that sort of thing than me. Um, I'm no longer um, uh, the president of SAMA, but uh, it is a wonderful organization like BAM, and it's a great community of people um, for when you're working uh, in isolation in your studio, which is what I did. I didn't know any other mosaic artists. Uh, an organization like BAM connects you to other people, and you can share ideas and also feel not so alone. So um, that being said, um, I just want to say also that um, I started the Chicago Mosaic School because I was working in isolation. I did want to learn about mosaic art and technique because I found myself very frustrated that I wanted to say things, but technically I was not able to do that. So that led me on a very long journey um, through uh, friendships over the internet, through travel, and ultimately for me founding the school in Chicago and bringing artists from all over the world to me. So it was a selfish thing initially, but um, we now um, are pretty big and we are academically based. But the talk I'm going to give today is really about your voice that's inside and what it is that you want to say with your work. Because we have a lot of uh, students that come to the school and they want to learn technique. They want to know how to cut. They want to know how to use hammer and hardy. They want to know color theory. But they have nothing to say. Or it's not that they don't have anything to say, they don't know how to connect with that voice. So um, so when you're in your studio and you're faced with a blank canvas or blank board, um, anything is possible. Anything. I mean, it's a wonderful thing that we all have these tools and these materials that are so beautiful. and. And hopefully we have time and space that we can make this work. But what is it that we want to say? Um, I know that I have plenty of images in my head that I've always had since I was a little girl. Um, in fact, I got in trouble uh, for drawing on the walls of my bedroom in crayon. So my mother uh, actually put uh, paper up on the wall in the garage. And I was able to like create my world that was in my head and put it on paper and share it with other people. So I think that experience really um, helped me evolve into an artist. And it made me want to communicate through the things I see in my head. Um, some of us are, are passionate about recreating the beauty that we experience. And some of us create work to initiate conversation or controversy perhaps like the lady in the front row here. Um, some of us may create to discover something unknown about ourselves, maybe for relaxation, maybe for self-discovery, maybe for therapy, maybe for play. Um, there are no uh, wrong answers here. It's just that I feel if you pay attention to why you're doing something, you can do it better. So that consciousness uh, can really help you in your practice. Um, we are all here in this room um, because we're passionate about mosaics. Otherwise, I'm sure you would find better things to do with your time today. Um, this passion for mosaics is, is kind of um, obsessive almost with a lot of us. Um, it is a driving force that um, is like love itself. You can't really define love. How do you define love? You can define love, I feel, through art through music, through poetry. But to give it words in a sentence, in a dictionary, it's very difficult. For me, visually, it's much easier to speak these things with feelings. Um, 
passion and love are beautiful and mysterious forces, and artistic expression takes courage to face fear, ridicule, and competence. So, and incompetence, sorry. Um, it's, you have to be brave to show your feelings, really. And um, so I think a lot of us don't want to show who we are or, or don't know what we want to say, so it prevents us from being free. And if you look at children's work, for example, uh, they're, they're unfiltered. They're just playing and having a wonderful time and describing all sorts of things, beautiful and ugly, because no one has told them that they can't. No one has told them that uh, it's bad because as a child, it's all acceptable. And somehow, when we become adults, we lose that freedom because someone has told us or we feel judged. So if we can lose that voice, I think it will, it will help uh, us be free in our work. Um, I saw this while I was here, obviously. <laughs> Put this in. Um, uh, what are our motivations to create? Why do you make that? I mean, this for me is a great example of a message that, that, that so strongly motivated by uh, this, this anniversary. Um, and visually, it's very powerful and beautiful. Um, when we create things that we don't always know why, looking at our process may help us get clear about our true mo motivation. And when we understand our intentions or why we make the work, we can do it better uh, with greater direction, skill, and empowerment. And, and when you're working on projects such as Laurel True, you also need an organizational system to do that. Um, you also need studio space. You also need time. You need to set time aside to create your work. So let's look at some reasons for, um, that may be motivating uh, you to make your work. Uh, for beauty, uh, beauty is, is a way to, to, to touch a divine quality in our individual consciousness. Um, we, we also uh, can pay deep attention to things. When we find something beautiful and observe it carefully, uh, we can start to feel something. Um, it also expresses the truth. And in the face of beauty, we are completely silent, silenced and become small. Uh, so uh, in contemporary work, I don't think that beauty is as important, uh, really. Um, uh, beauty is continually suspect in, in contemporary work, and it's not considered rigorous or tough-minded to be taken seriously, usually. Um, that's why more classical work is less, uh, uh, less um, aggressively getting you to feel something or to think something or like your work, Carrie, like make you have a strong statement or reaction. Uh, it's very peaceful to look at something beautiful or decorative. Um, so this is another question uh, I always have. What is it that you want to say and who are you saying it to? Who is your audience? Um, are you making work to sell? Are you, are you wanting to support yourself from making artwork, which personally I think is an insane idea. I don't know anyone who would like go into art to support themselves. I mean, that's even the, the most successful artists that I know uh, who sell everything, they still uh, need to have a, a supplemental career in teaching or perhaps lecturing at BAM. I don't know. It's very difficult to make a living just from the sales of work. Um, also, uh, uh, you, to describe something personal about your own life experience. I um, have things that I want to say that I can't write about. And obviously, I can't talk about them too well either. I'm much more comfortable drawing. I'm much more comfortable in my studio. And for me, these pieces that I make symbolize and sort of um, uh, gel the feelings or um, experiences that I have. And then I can move past it. It's, it's like I'm digesting this emotion or experience, and then I move on to the next thing that I want to talk about. And it's, again, back to that same idea is the inside out. I want to have these things exist in the, re in the real world as objects. Um, so do you, um, 
make it intelligible, your work? Is your work literal? So that I look at your work and say, okay, that's a soldier. I know what it is. This is about war. Thank you. I, I, I need to think about this now. Or is it an abstract piece that is mysterious and I have to bring my own uh, history and interpretation to it? Um, I would say that no matter what you do, don't adjust your work for the marketplace. Uh, stay true to yourself, regardless of the consequences of, of feeling rejected or accepted from selling your work. If you're true to your own voice, it's going to be unique and beautiful. And um, do it for yourself. I, I think it's very hard to be a commercial artist and make product. Uh, we have the, the power to speak our own words through art or through music or through poetry. And all of you are doing that. It's just that we can do it better if we think about it. Um, so this goes to uh, about voice and skill. Um, in today's artistic circles, including this one, um, I think a lack of craft or skill is admired in a way. It's naive. Um, lack of skill is perceived to give art an authentic, original look, which is true. Yet this returning to a purely academic system is not at all what I'm suggesting. Uh, if you want to express yourself with a clear voice, um, learning your craft and studying it and uh, taking classes and reading about uh, mosaics is a good start. Um, I use violin as an example because my, I, my sister is a concert violin. Uh, if she gave me a violin to express myself, uh, I probably would not be able to do that. Uh, especially if she gave me a, a violin and told me to stand up and perform in front of you, I would not do that either because I had not trained, uh, I had no experience, and um, I wouldn't understand the tools of how to speak through that instrument like my sister does. It takes rigorous training. It takes lots of questions. It takes listening to other artists playing. And um, at some point after, after that, you'll be ready to perform. I think many artists are, are rush, like, oh, I made my first piece. I'm going to be in an art show now. And I think that's great that you want to show everyone your work. But also, maybe do another piece and practice. And don't make each piece so sacred. Every piece you make is an experiment. It's not a masterpiece. I, was, I, I know that when I was in art school, I was told, um, you're not going to make your masterpiece until you've lived your life, until you're like 70 or 80. And I, at the time, I was 21 years old. I was very disappointed because I was sure that I was like the next big thing, like Luciana was saying when she was in art school. Oh yeah, I'm gonna, you know, make my work. I'm gonna sell it. I'm gonna be famous. I'm gonna, you know, be Mrs. Picasso, whatever. It's not like that. And now that I'm older, also, that is not at all important to me. What is important to me is have the, is having the time and the patience to create my work. That makes me so happy. That makes me so happy. And I hope that you can have that experience, too. Um, so some of the things that help finding your voice are a strong foundation. Um, I'm a huge advocate of drawing, which may like scare a lot of you right now. But drawing, I mean, if you can draw a stick figure, I say you can draw. Um, drawing is like shorthand. Uh, for a mosaic artist. It, it helps you make notes, visual notes, for what you want to say. Um, it helps you plan your mosaic. It helps you, I mean, if you're going to make a mosaic, you have to prepare all your materials, you have to buy all your materials, you have to have all the tools, you have to have all the time, spend all this energy to create this piece that you didn't draw out necessarily in the first place, and it's not exactly what you wanted, and you spent like, two weeks doing this piece that now you see, if I, if I had d just done this line a little better, it would have made me happy. So doing the work up front by drawing and having a foundation in drawing, two-dimensional work, uh, mosaic art history. And I'm not saying go to school, but you can, you can research these things yourself. Look at other artists or, or go to another artist who does drawing. 
and ask them for advice. It's very helpful and, and you'll find it makes your mosaic practice a little bit easier as well. Um, so diligence, which means don't give up. <laughs> Ever give up. Just stay in your studio. Even if you make a horrible, awful, ugly thing that you immediately throw, throw in the trash after you almost finished it because it was so horrible, do another piece. It's like getting back on the horse. Uh, every piece is, is a learning piece for you. Um, mosaics are like, uh, for me, finally, I have found a way to speak through the tessera. So every single piece for me is like a letter uh, in the alphabet. And every line of tessera is a sentence. And all together, they say something, or create a mood or a flow. And that, that has been a really happy thing for me to discover. And it's taken me 20 years to figure out this language because I had to unlearn so many things. Um, but again, uh, uh, using mosaics as a vocabulary for your inner voice is possible. Um, your vision, uh, what is it that you want to make? So for me, I have a process of drawing uh, lots of drawings first and then picking something that definitely needs to exist in the world that I want to do or that could be challenging. Um, so uh, ha keep a notebook full of lots of things. Uh, and then again, mastery. Mastery, um, it's funny, a lot of people call each other masters, uh, mosaic masters or painting masters, and if you actually talk to any of those masters, they're like, I'm still a student. I'm not a master. I'm still learning. I mean, I, I know a 90-year-old artist who said, I think I'm finally getting the hang of it. And he, he's a very well-known artist, and he's been doing it all his life. But he knows that he still, he still hasn't have it solved. He doesn't have this mystery of art solved. OK, so your art practice. Um, and they say practice makes perfect, and I disagree. I think practice makes closer to perfect. So um, when you practice, when you, and when I say practice, I mean, when you go in your studio on a regular basis, and you have your, your uh, materials prepared for you so that when you get in there, you, you can work. Instead of walking around your table for an hour trying to find the blue or looking for your tools or discovering that you left your tools dirty and you have to clean them or the phone rings. If you're prepared, uh, then you can just go. You can go and, uh, and make something. Um, if you don't do anything, uh, I actually had a couple of years where I really didn't do anything. I actually walked around the studio of my table for a couple, for about 18 months because I was just in this funk and um, I think I was afraid to take that first step into my next place where I was because my because I was in a different place in my life and my work had changed. I didn't want to do what I was doing before, so I was afraid because I was afraid, I didn't know what I was doing anymore. So the first thing I did after that is I just started making something. It, I, without judgment. It's like, just make something. And that became comfortable, so it turned into a practice again. Um, practice results in the refinement of one's ideas. So, so if you have an idea and you make a piece, maybe you see something you can do better in the next piece. Maybe it's a series. Um, and practice does result in discipline. I, I know that when I'm working regularly, I don't question what I'm doing so much because it becomes more natural. Just like playing music, it's, it's, it just flows out of you in a much easier way. If you, if you have a big break in between doing your work, like if you do a piece uh, now and then wait till March to do the next piece, it's like a new scary thing to start over again. So it's good to do something. I also like scheduled uh, a, a specific time uh, a couple times a week that I'm in the studio. No excuses. It doesn't matter what else I have going on. That is my private time. So I, I don't know if that helps you. It, it did help me. Um, so I love this quote. Uh, Art is the illusion of spontaneity. But I mean, you need to prepare your materials. How can... Uh, uh, 
mosaic sp spontaneous. I know Alana Shafir taught uh, a spontaneous mosaic, but she also collected her materials over a period of time and everything, there was a lot of preparation in there. So the end result may look like it, it, it was spon created spontaneously, which is a wonderful thing, but um, it isn't so much that. Um, so these are some questions. What do you think about while you work? Do you listen to music? Do you listen to the news? Do you think about your shopping list? or what you're supposed to be doing instead of uh, you're not taking care of your family, you're in your studio. Um, these things can um, go into your work. I mean, these can also calm you down while you work and um, hopefully help you process all your stuff. Um, is there planning and preparation, which I've um, spoken about a couple of times, like preparing your, your materials ahead of time is a huge time saver. Uh, it took me 10 years to figure that out. I can't even imagine how much time I could have saved by instead of <laughs> cutting and then <laughs> gluing and then cutting and then gluing, if I cut, 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 and then I can glue, 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 it goes a lot faster. So I probably would have twice as much work at this point. And also, um, when you have a practice, uh, your process is full of care and consciousness because it becomes part of the rhythm of your life. So I'm going to play a short video here if I can do that, sir, in the bright light, if you can help me do that. Uh, this is a short video that uh, we made about voice and vision in uh, Mosaic Art, and it's about four, it's very yeah. short. Sorry for the um, narrator. Uh, it's about four different artists, different uh, processes. Visual art is a way of communicating with images, allowing our imagination to be seen outside of ourselves. It is a record of our existence and a relic of our human experience. Each of us possesses a unique set of tools to communicate meaningful ideas that connect us with others on a deeper level. The process of how and why an artist creates can be mysterious. The evolution of an idea can start from a deeply personal place or be sparked by something tangible or unconscious. Mosaic artists may have chosen this path of making because of its process and its tactile nature. Mosaic art gives an artist the ability to be incredibly sensitive and poetic in a way that differs from other art forms. The process of discovering the poetry within mosaic happens over time with dedication, study, and practice. Do you create from an emotional place, or is it to tell a story? Or is it purely the desire to share beauty with the world? Here we will get a glimpse of four artists, all impassioned by mosaic, yet each driven by a different approach. I was nine years old, and uh, with the um, uh, teacher of the elementary school, after we studied Byzantine mosaics, we made a small project all together. And since that day, every day of my life, I work or I think about doing mosaic. Uh, it's uh, exactly the same. It's uh, every time, every instant, it's like playing. We most uh, all agree mosaic is a language and uh, Creating a mosaic is like uh, writing, and uh, writing with the tester I cut, it's the only way. Uh, writing with uh, the, um, or making mosaic with tester cut by somebody else, it will be like uh, talking with the words of somebody else. There is always a surprise. I really think there is no end in this process of learning and um, uh, every time uh, I take a piece of stone it's um, I don't know what what I'm gonna find when I open it or uh, how it's gonna respond uh, with the hammer um, plus in the, in the process of creating a mosaic it's uh, always a mix of uh, knowledge and uh, emotions uh, uh, who constantly cross each other and uh, um, knowing 
everything, it will be impossible. When I look in my work, I see it's like telling my story. It's, um, there is a lot of personal story behind uh, just uh, the drawing to, to read. I normally use a female form as my inspiration. And that's how I usually I, I began. And somewhere in the process, there's something that comes out that's inside of me that comes out into my art. My personality goes into the piece. And then there's like a special meaning to it that then comes out Whatever it is, but it's during the process, I'm working through a feeling that I'm experiencing at that time. Whether I'm very sad or I'm very happy, I might be going through some kind of issue. And this art form really helps me work through whatever I'm going through in a really interesting way. What I really love about this art is that after I'm, if this is said and done, my, my emotions come out like in such a wild way that in the end result, I've kind of like worked through it, but piece by piece, because this, this art form is not just about cutting a piece and following a picture. This was a whole process for me. It started with my feeling, and in the end, it, it tells a story. And I've, I've worked, it's like, it's an amazing healing process. Since I've gotten into doing this, it's therapy for me. It just, it sort of evolves. It doesn't have like any direction. I ask myself how I'm feeling and then I make a line and then another line and then I connect those lines and I create this space around that line and that shape and then uh, I'll get frustrated and I'll do something like really mad at it and then something turns out good about it. I don't know. It's, it's a curious thing. At, at first when I started mosaicing I had an idea what I wanted to mosaic and I would translate that into a mosaic using color and glass. I'm trying to incorporate more natural objects, less manufactured things. So I've moved a little way away from glass. I've definitely moved away from beads, but I'm still incorporating stones and natural objects. And I'm using more marble. And then I'm using smalty, which is manufactured glass, but I cut it with my hands into my shapes. And so, and then I use those shapes. I'm also have incorporated using ceramic material that I have fabricated. Again, ceramics for me is sort of like drawing in a sculptural way. I've just always worked with my hands. You know, I was, um, you know, whether it's, it's mosaics or drawing or ceramics or sewing or knitting or cooking or fixing an object, um, taking things apart, putting things back together. I've always had a fascination with that and I need my hands to do that. So it's a natural thing for me to do. I love it, but at the same time, it's not easy. It's probably one of the most difficult things I've done in terms of kind of having an intersection of, you know, physical force with concentration, with letting the process sweep me into a flow, but at the same time not letting myself get too carried away. Like, I have to be also practical and I feel so fortunate because I'm able to work with other artists, be inspired by other mosaicists. And in this piece, for example, I see all these different people who I feel gratitude for because it wouldn't be this way without all of them. It's something that my arms and hands want to do. There's this force, there's almost like this magnetism that it has. I just feel like it's, there's this pull. I'm just pulled to it.
So, hope you enjoyed that video. Okay, so this is my little um, summary checklist here for you. Um, this, this is like how I, if I, I'm um, completely dumbfounded what to do, this is a way I stimulate uh, some ideas. I sometimes use words to brainstorm things. If I have words, I can see a picture with that word. So um, I'll make lists of where I, what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, sad, happy, um, children, teenagers, angry, whatever it is, uh, it will help me and lead me to more words and hopefully more pictures, which I will draw. Um, I like to look at work and see what's really great about it, what I love about it. What is it that I want to emulate in that work? What is it that I don't like about that work? And I do that with my own stuff all the time. I am my own worst critic, but not so much that it's, it, it, it paralyzes me. I think it's good to have conversations and look at your work critically, um, but look at other people's work too and see where you are uh, amongst those people or what it is that you aspire to be. Um, draw, which we already talked about, uh, write, um, journaling uh, is very helpful too. Um, if you read your own stories uh, in a journal, you'll realize how many stories you do have. And what it is, if you close your eyes or open your eyes, you can maybe think of something that, that you want to express in your work that has to do with uh, your story. Um, so be observant and sensitive. Also, when you're looking at work and when you're in the studio, um, it, when you look at work, I always say it's better to see what work than look at work. A lot of times we, we just walk by it. You know, art galleries aren't great places to look at work because there's no place to sit and contemplate the work. So if, if you're not in a gallery or a museum, take a look at that work on, on a on the internet or something and spend some time at looking at the design of it, looking at the composition, looking at the materials, looking at the colors. What is it that you like, that you would like to bring into your own work and practice? Um, I just said look at art, didn't I? So that's sort of a do-over. Uh, time management, again, um, set time aside in your studio practice. If you really want to do this, if you really want to grow as an artist, you need to make the time. It's not always easy to make the time. Um, I wanted to be an artist when I was in high school, and I remember telling my art teacher, like, I don't have time to make art. I have too much homework. I don't have time to make art. And he said to me, well, you don't have to sleep. If you really want to make it, you don't have to sleep. And I was taken aback by that. But he was absolutely right. If it's that important, I won't find an excuse not to do it. So make the time is a good, good thing. And also slow down. Um, if we're in a hurry to finish our work, um, that's going to come through. But also, I think um, we're in a hurry in the rest of our lives living it. We live in a fast, fast world. It's crazy. So uh, the studio is the time where we can slow down. There's no rush to get uh, work done unless, of course, you have a deadline uh, You know, immediately and <laughs> have to do it. But doing work slowly and conscientiously will really change the work itself. You probably already know this stuff, so I'm just sort of trying to be your inner voice here. Um, and this is really important, is to find a community. So I think you guys already have found a community here, um, but you're not maybe located all closely. Um, so if there's a, a group of artists or a group of creatives that you can hook up with, that, that you can get together with and bring your piece and a bottle of wine or some coffee and crumpets or whatever you want to do, and look at the work together so you can get honest feedback or just share the experience of making work, I think that makes you feel very connected uh, to the world, that someone else can feel something too, that someone else can create something too. I know that when I listen to some music, I'm, uh, so the music that I love, I'm like, oh, I, someone else feels that way. 
it's so refreshing and so comforting to have a community where, uh, especially in mosaics, where they understand what you're talking about when you're talking about nippers. I mean, it's very helpful that you're already speaking the same language in mosaics. So a community can really support you critically and in every creative way. And this is like the most important thing is to trust yourself. Get rid of the, that voice in the back that says you can't or you suck, or you're not an artist, or that's ugly. These are very destructive things that have no place in your studio at all. You need to forge ahead and try and quiet those voices. And I know for some of us, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to do that. But once you do that, you're going to discover that you can play again, and you're gonna find a new joy in just making mistakes or, or experimenting with these things without having um, the fear of failure upon you. So, um, so your work um, probably is going to change and transform. If you look at any artist that you admire through their lifetime, they went through stages and that's because we are not uh, statues. We are growing, we are changing. The, the, the circumstances of our lives are completely, co continually fluctuating. So who I was at 21 making that work, I cannot be that person now. And that's okay. And I don't know what I'm gonna be doing next week either because I'm not the same as I, as I was. So feel free to experiment in your work because you're going to grow because you're growing old <laughs> anyway so um, so why are we making our work I I hope it's about love because we love this so much we love to use our hands we have to say something we want to tell our stories we want to create something beautiful so I'm just encouraging you all to uh, get in your studios and um, make the world more beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.